Go ahead. Okay. Uh, hold on a second. I, uh, my mouse is. Uh, yeah, this is very nice, very clear. Hold on. I have to get out of this here for a second. So for those who, who's not uh, speaking, please uh, uh, mute your microphone so we get better, we get better signal. I have something in, in the way on my screen. I have to get rid of it. There we go. Try again. Oh, pardon me. Um, let's try one more time from the top. Okay. Uh, so good day, everyone. Um, uh, let me begin by thanking Pen Shang for inviting me to talk about uh, topological superconductors. Um, I'm going to focus on uh, two chiral spin triplets superconductors, um, the chiral phase of superfluid helium-3 uh, and the low temperature B phase of uranium platinum-3. So um, along the way, I'll try and uh, give you enough introduction so that you understand the, the basic structure of these condensates. Uh, I'm going <clears> to <throat> highlight recent work um, on anomalous Hall transport. Um, that's with my collaborator, uh, collaborators, Alexei Shetsov um, and uh, Wave Nam Brudikorn. Um, they're postdocs who've since left, and with my former student, Priya Sharma, who's at Royal Holloway. And uh, all of the work that I've been interested in recently in, in the context of uh, chiral condensates is been informed by my experimental colleagues, um, particularly uh, Kimitoshi Kono and um, <clears throat> Hiroki Ikigami at Riken, uh, Jivak Parpia at Cornell, uh, Bill Halperin at Northwestern, and, and John Saunders at Royal Holloway. And uh, so the newer results that I'm going to uh, re report to today are based on uh, these uh, publications I've shown you here. Uh, both on helium-3 and in and the context of chiral superconductors. So let me, uh, <clears throat> let me start with uh, defining uh, the two key symmetries uh, that are broken in, in a, that give rise to uh, chiral uh, condensates. Um, so this is a, a, a cartoon of uh, chiral enantiomers, which are polyatomic uh, molecules. Uh, which are, um, are left right handed versions of the same molecule, of, the, of, of otherwise the same atomic constituents. Um, hold on, I got, I got all sorts of weather alerts appearing on my screen here and I can't actually see. Um, I'm sorry, I mean, I hope the weather is okay in Northwestern. Uh, we, we're getting ready to get hammered. Uh, 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 okay, there we go. Um, <clears throat> So uh, as I said, chiral enantiomers are um, mirror reflected or left and right handed versions of the molecule. Uh, and um, it, diatomic molecules, I'm having real troubles here with my, my mouse. There we go. Um, chiral superfluids or chiral condensates uh, can be formed out of diatomic molecules if the ground state of the molecule is in motion. So uh, this particular wave function shown here corresponds to Cooper pair with orbital angle momentum nu h bar. Uh, and the orbital motion uh, breaks mirror symmetry, but it also breaks uh, time reversal symmetry. And the um, product of the two is what I call chiral symmetry. And uh, these types of uh, uh, superfluid or superconducting condensates were first investigated by by Phil Anderson and, and Philippe Morel in 1961, well before the discovery of uh, superfluid helium-3. So <clears throat> chiral superconductors, where are they? Uh, I believe a helium-3A uh, is, is a definitive example of a chiral superfluid based on quantitative theory and experiment. And uh, uranium platinum-3 um, is a heavy fermion superconductor, which uh, I think shows strong evidence of chirality, um, particularly based on polar Kerr effect, but 
there's also earlier indications based on, on um, USR line width studies. Um, but we would like to know a little bit more. We'd like to know precisely the, the nature of the chiral order and what is the topological quantum number, the churn number. Strontium ruthenate is another good candidate. There are signs of chirality, but, but uh, I think the situation is a little less clear. So we would like to have bulk probes uh, to test for uh, chirality, and that's one of the things I want to talk about today. And of course, there are many other uh, candidates that have been put forward uh, by theorists and experimentalists, and uh, bulk probes of chirality uh, would be very useful. And some of the key signatures are, are edge states, vial or Majorana edge states, uh, that would be confined on the edges of, uh, of these uh, superconductors. Um, uh, and also exotic vortices, um, for example, half quantum vortices. But uh, what I want to focus on is a bulk response, uh, uh, an anomalous Hall response to electric or thermal gradients. So let's see. Let me just uh, give you, be, be precise about what I'm talking about here. So here's, uh, here's a sample of a chiral superfluid. And <clears throat> broken time reversal and mirror symmetries uh, can be revealed by anomalous Hall transport. So uh, what that means is that there's a component of the charge or the heat current that's perpendicular to the applied potential or thermal gradient. And secondly, uh, it reverses sign if you measure the same response for a left-handed chiral condensate. Uh, if you change the chiral axis as I've shown here in red, if you reverse its direction. And the Hall conducti conductivity shown here is the off-diagonal components of these two-component two tensors uh, are allowed by chiral symmetry. And the anomalous Hall effect occurs in zero external field. And it's the internal motion of the condensate uh, represented by the chiral axis here in this little that's essential for understanding the mechanism responsible for anomalous Hall effect or anomalous thermal Hall effect. So uh, observation of, of anomalous Hall effects, uh, either thermal or, or charged, would be a definitive signature of chiral condensate. And uh, when you combine theory and experiment uh, together, you can identify not only the churn number, but uh, the broken orbital symmetries of the superconductor. So helium-3, as I stated, is the only definitively identified chiral superfluid uh, it's chiral P wave with nu equal one. And I'm going to give you uh, my view of why I can make such a strong statement about helium 3A. So let's see if I'm, somehow I'm not, there we go. A little background um, for those who are not as familiar with uh, superfluid helium. First, it's a, it's a Fermi liquid below about one Kelvin degree, undergoes a pairing transition uh, around two and a half uh, millikelvin. So the region in white in this phase diagram is uh, the normal Fermi liquid. Uh, the, normal, the normal state has a very high degree of symmetry. And that phase is invariant under rotations in spin space, orbital space, it's invariant under the U1 uh, global gauge group and parity and time inversion symmetry. And that allows for a lot of room for symmetry breaking phase transitions to occur. So below TC, uh, we have a transition into a spin triplet uh, P wave superfluids. And in fact, there are two realizations uh, of the P wave spin triplet condensates um, shown here. The largest part of the phase diagram is, is the so-called B phase. It was, um, Theoretically investigated first by Balian and Wertheimer um, in 1963. Uh, and it has the property that all three uh, components of the spin triplet are present. And uh, they're correlated with the orbital components of the uh, P wave multiplet, such that the ground state is total angular momentum zero. So it's L equal, L equal one, S equal one, J equals zero. So if you like describing the residual symmetry, the, 
the two rotation groups break down to uh, SO3, where the generator is the total angular momentum. And in this phase, time reversal symmetry is preserved. So that's an important fact to keep in mind as I go down the line or go down <coughs> uh, to describe the Hall effect. Um, the other phase uh, that exists at high pressure and uh, high temperature is, is the chiral phase of helium-3. It was first discussed by Anderson and Morrell, um, and it has a different set of broken symmetries. Uh, it breaks the spin and orbital rotation symmetry down to uh, two U1 symmetries, rotations about an axis in spin space and rotations uh, about an axis uh, defined by the angular momentum. And this is a combined symmetry under rotation, axial rotations with elements of the gauge group. It has a discrete symmetry, which is this Z2 symmetry, which is the chiral symmetry I mentioned to you earlier. So the wave functions I've shown you here, uh, you can kind of visually see, if you think about angular momentum counting that the Boleyn and Wertheimer state is J equals zero, and you see that the, an, an, the A phase, the anderson morel phase, has just two components of the triplet present with equal magnitude of amplitude. So it's so-called equal spin pairing state. Both orbital, both components of that spin state have the same uh, orbital angular momentum. So you can think of this phase as a spin anti-ferromagnet and an orbital ferromagnet. Now you might not, you might wonder why why so much emphasis on the A phase since it just occupies this little corner up here. Um, but you can stabilize the A phase at all temperatures and pressures uh, if you confine it into a film, quasi two dimensional film. So this is the phase diagram under confinement where D on the horizontal axis here is the thickness of the film. And as you um, as you confine it below about five coherence lengths or so, you always stabilize the chiral A phase. And just to give you a physical dimension, uh, this uh, unit 10 here on the x-axis, 10 coherence lengths, roughly a tenth of a micron. And <clears throat> the group at Royal Holloway has been uh, <clears throat> developing techniques to confine helium-3 down to smaller and smaller dimensions. And they've now measured the A phase using nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, stabilized down to 70 nanometer thick films. Now, as you dimensionally confine helium 3A to thinner and thinner films, you, uh, the dimensional confinement uh, <clears throat> breaks the Fermi surface up into Fermi disks. And, and so you'll have, uh, say, N Fermi disks here, depending on the thickness each of which is fully gapped. So you have a set of fully gapped chiral um, superconductor superfluids here on each Fermi surface. And uh, they're topological uh, with, a, with, a, with a topology that's very similar to that of the uh, integer quantum Hall system. One of the early predictions uh, going back to Anderson and Morrell was that this phase would have a a macroscopic ground state angle momentum. It would be in motion. And um, I think the, the issue is settled uh, theoretically as to the value of that ground state angle momentum, but it hasn't been measured to date. So this was one of the outstanding questions uh, to be resolved experimentally is what is the ground state angle momentum? So we're hoping that those experiments will come forward in the near future. But, <clears throat> Remarkable experiments were carried out at RECAN, which uh, definitively identified the A phase as, uh, as the uh, chiral phase with broken mirror and time reversal symmetry. So that came from the measurement of an anomalous Hall effect of electrons moving in liquid helium 3A. And uh, to understand the physics behind uh, this uh, anomalous Hall effect, uh, it's directly connected with the ground state topology of the A phase, and which are derived from its broken symmetries and the existence of chiral edge states. 
So I'm gonna try and explain the physics of this because it also informs the physics of anomalous thermal Hall effect that uh, I want to discuss in the context of uranium platinum three. I'm not moving again. There we go. Quick, uh, uh, quick little tutorial on uh, the uh, uh, topological quantum numbers. Uh, probably many people are, are, are first familiar with the context of topology and condensed matter physics in the context of, uh, of uh, topological defects, for example, in, in superfluid helium. Uh, a vortex line here, uh, if we encircle it and measure the uh, change in phase around that uh, vortex line, uh, it, it can have an integer winding number. So there's the, the topology is encoded in the, in the measure of the global phase winding around, the, around this singular vortex line. But what I want to also point out is that if, if we have a fermion condensate, then you can have, this will give rise to massless fermions confined on the vortex core in real space. Now, for the bulk um, A phase, or chiral phase, uh, the topology is, is defined uh, in terms of the Cooper pair wave function in momentum space, which I've, I've shown here uh, as, a, as an image of the, its amplitude over the Fermi surface. Uh, it too has a, a phase in momentum space if we wind around uh, any of these singular points, either the north or south pole. So the topological quantum number, which can be directly related to the churn number, is just the angular momentum of uh, the Cooper pair wave function. And uh, analogous to real space topology, um, the existence of this uh, topological quantum number implies the existence of massless chiral fermions in three dimensions confined near the nodal points. Uh, but if we gap out uh, the, uh, the uh, the nodes, um, by going to two dimensions or quasi two dimensions, we get chiral edge, we get, we get uh, massless fermions only confined on boundaries uh, where the topology changes. So chiral edge fermions. So now I want you to imagine that, um, that, you're, that <clears throat> we have a two dimensional film of superfluid helium 3A a single chiral phase everywhere in space. And, uh, and someone drills a hole in the superfluid, a small hole of radius R, um, we're gonna develop chiral edge states uh, and edge currents that flow along this boundary. And we can calculate the uh, sheet current uh, that, that circulates uh, around this, uh, this hole. And it turns out to be quantized in units of Planck's constant in the, in the density of helium. So we also know its sign. The uh, edge current counter circulates, namely it gives rise to a left-handed circulating current in the right-handed chiral vacuum. And the hole has an angular momentum. We can compute the angular momentum very simply. And it turns out to be the number of Cooper pairs removed from the hole. Now, if we were to move the hole from one point to another, uh, that angular momentum would be transported with a hole. So the message here is that an object that you insert into helium that displaces the helium, it's a potential, it inherits angular momentum from the condensate of chiral pairs. One of the beautiful things about electrons play, uh, studies in helium is they provide us with precisely this kind of tool. The electron, if I can, I'm stuck. There we go. Electrons in helium have been studied uh, for many decades, um, uh, but it's a beautiful system in which if you apply an electric field the, the vertical field that I've shown here in black, you can push the electron uh, into the helium. It takes about a volt to do so. And the very light mass of the electron, uh, that zero point motion blows a hole in the, in the helium and forms a bubble. And the bubble is about 
a di diameter of about three, three nanometers, but it displaces uh, more than a hundred atoms. And so what you get is a self-trapped polaron here of charge E with a mass of about a hundred helium three masses. And one of the remarkable things about the mobility of these bubbles is that they're sufficiently large that there's enough collisions, even at low temperature, that the mobility of, that the scattering is effectively uh, uh, elastic, quasi-elastic, uh, down to very, very low temperatures. So from temperatures from about 50 millikelvin to TC, which is on the order of a millikelvin, uh, the mobility is independent of temperature. Is determined purely by the cross section for quasi particles scattering off of the bubble uh, and the density of uh, helium 3. Well, what happens if you go below TC in the chiral phase? Now you have a number of Bogolyubov quasi particles that can scatter off of this bubble. And you have now a broken symmetry for in the chiral phase. And <clears throat> this. Uh, presence of this chiral axis and these chiral fermions gives rise to a, an anomalous Hall current as you push the bubble through the medium. So in addition to the drag force shown here in red uh, against the applied trend, uh, in plane electric field, you'll get a, uh, uh, a Hall current uh, proportional to E cross L. And this was first pointed out by Salmelin Salomon Minyev in, in 89, and uh, of course you'll get it in a corresponding Hall ratio and in uh, a Hall angle. This was the motivation for um, experiments that were carried out at RECAN, um, which I've uh, shown here. This is um, uh, Hir Hiroki Ikigami and Susumi and Kono's paper uh, from, from their paper in science in 2013. And they set out to, uh, to basically test this, um, this idea uh, by uh, embedding electrons into the, into the chiral phase of, into the A phase of helium-3 and driving those bubbles with a voltage shown here with this split electrodes and then splitting the <clears throat> downstream uh, electrodes uh, and measuring the asymmetry, looking for an asymmetry in the current response. So, <clears throat> The, the signature then of the anomalous Hall effect for electrons is to be an asymmetry in the current and also a reversal of that current uh, asymmetry if you reverse the chirality of the, of the ground state. Well, indeed, they observed both of these properties, um, um, uh, both the asymmetry of the current and uh, the reversal with reversal of the chiral axis. So, these are uh, traces. These are two different runs uh, on uh, uh, measuring the, um, uh, this is very low frequency, a few, a few Hertz. Uh, so there's, an in, there's two quadratures of the current response, the real and imaginary part of the re response. And if you look at the trace in blue for the trajectory that goes normal into the A phase, you see the onset of the asymmetry in the current in both quadratures. And if you drop the trajectory such that you enter the B phase, after you enter the A phase, the asymmetry in the current disappears. And that's the, uh, as expected, as I mentioned earlier, the B phase is time reversal symmetric. So to me, this uh, was a really powerful demonstration of the, uh, uh, of anomalous Hall transport in, in, um, in helium 3A. So after seeing this, I, I was and it quantitatively. So with uh, Alexi and I, we developed a theory for helium-3 uh, quasi-particle scattering in the A phase. So chiral fermions scattering off of electron bubbles. Um, and <clears throat> from that computing the, the structure of the electron bubble in the A phase, uh, and also the forces that are moving on that, that bubble in the A phase. So I'm gonna try and um, uh, sh uh, capture the essence of the theory uh, in pictures. So let's start in the normal phase. 
um, we apply an electric field and we push an electron through a gas of quasi-particles, uh, uh, <clears throat> it experiences a headwind uh, with a, from the excess collisions in the forward direction leading to Stokes drag on the electron bubble. And in a Fermi liquid, there are two types of excitations, quasi-particles and holes, and both of them contribute uh, equally to the Stokes drag on the bubble. Now, <clears throat> in a BCS superfluid, um, additional uh, collision processes occur. A, a quasi-particle shown here can branch convert into a quasi-hole and in the process add a Cooper pair to the condensate. And the reverse process also occurs. Uh, hole converts to a particle and with a destruction of a Cooper pair. And these are both Andreev processes. Now things are more interesting if that, car, that condensate is a chiral condensate, because now multiple branch conversion scattering leads to chiral edge states bound below the bulk gap. And the negative, uh, the negative energy uh, subgap states carry unidirectional chiral edge currents <clears throat> bound to the bubble shown here as the, this green circulating current. So the first thing that happens is the bubble not only acquires a mass, but now in the A phase, it acquires an angular momentum. And it turns out to be about 100 H bar. Now the bubble, <clears throat> as I said before, is left-handed in a right-handed chiral vacuum and vice versa. And the edge current, as you can see here, breaks mirror symmetry. And that <clears throat> leads to an asymmetry in the scattering amplitude for plus or minus deflections shown here. So you get different cross sections if you're scattering against the current or with the current. And this asymmetry is the origin of the skew scattering and the transverse force. So this is a calculation of the angular distribution of scattered quasi-particles. So momentum K is the incident um, Boglebov quasi-particle and the, uh, the ion is sitting at the origin. And uh, this is the in-plane angular distribution of scattered quasi-particles. So what you see here is, is uh, the size of the ion, by the way, is about, uh, once you determine it from the mobility, is, is about 11 Fermi wavelengths. And um, those chiral edge states that I mentioned earlier, um, they're all resonances below the gap, very sharp uh, bound state resonances. And they give rise to resonance scattering above the gap. And so you see here exactly 11 resonances. And you also see an asymmetry in the angular distribution of the scattered uh, quasi-particles. And from that, you can immediately infer that there's a force in the negative y direction on the ion. So uh, we use the scattering theory and kinetic theory to compute the average force on the ion uh, in order to get uh, these, <clears throat> this, this basic picture that uh, uh, the applied force and this skew scattering will, will produce then, of course, a hull motion to the, to the average motion of the bubble. So these are uh, the results for the drag mobility and the hull ratio uh, that were calculated uh, by Alexi and myself with a single input. Well, two inputs, TC. And the other input is the ionic radius, which is determined from the normal state mobility. And the, the comparison with the drag mobility is shown over almost two and a half decades here uh, with remarkable agreement. And I think uh, similarly for the uh, Hall ratio. And uh, <clears throat> This gives me a great deal of confidence that we really know what's going on in the chiral phase. And this is the direct uh, <clears throat> detection of the uh, broken uh, chiral and uh, the broken uh, time reversal and mirror symmetry. And in my view, it's also a indirect measure of the existence of chiral edge states bound to, uh, bound to the uh, electron bubble. So <clears throat> let me just summarize here. Um, 
uh, electrons in the in the chiral A phase are addressed by chiral fermions, a spectrum of them, uh, and they give rise to chiral edge states and chiral currents. And electrons are left-handed in a right-handed vacuum with an angle momentum of about 100 h-bar. The Rican mobility experiments was a direct observation uh, of anomalous Hall effect, and its origin is broken mirror and time reversal symmetry and skew scattering. And then one last numerical fact, which I, I find quite remarkable, is that if you look at the transverse force and you cast it into the form of uh, an effective Lorentz force, the effective magnetic field computed from the computed uh, from the uh, uh, the Hall uh, the Hall force uh, is about ten to the three to ten to the four Tesla, so it's a it's a substantial effect. Um, this is a scattering theory, and it, <clears throat> it will eventually fail. And uh, we've studied this in some detail, but that's a topic for another, another uh, time. I want to now go to talk about chiral superconductors. And uh, uh, one of the promising examples, uh, I mean, there's been many, many groups that have been looking for electronic materials that are <clears throat> that have similar types of broken symmetries and topology as exhibited in helium-3. And one good candidate is uranium platinum-3. Um, my colleague, Bill Halperin, and his group grow really uh, very fine single crystals of uranium platinum-3. And uh, shown here is the resistive transition um, um, in uranium platinum-3. By the way, I should say it's a, it's a heavy fermion superconductor, a heavy fermion uh, metal. Um, a very good Fermi liquid below about uh, five to 10 Kelvin. Um, you can see the resistivity here is uh, go, dropping as T squared. And then the, um, the superconducting transition at about 552 millikelvin in this sample with a width of about one a little over a millikelvin. Um, these are high purity samples with triple Rs of, you know, uh, upward of, um, uh, uh, 1000. And um, they're basically <clears throat> free of impurities. Uh, and, the re and the suppression of TC here turns out to be due to um, stacking faults. And so a series of studies on which annealing studies to and measuring stacking fault densities uh, and resi residual resistivities as shown by Jan Kitsch, um, uh, paper here shows the suppression of TC uh, with, with, uh, with weak disorder. So TC is indeed very sensitive to disorder as you would expect for an unconventional superconductor. Um, in fact, you can extrapolate that the ideal uh, crystal TC is about 563 millikelvin from this, this, this image here. Now, <clears throat> This uh, uh, the resistance uh, the resistive resistive transition shows you only one transition, but the other connection to helium three is that uranium platinum three has multiple superconducting phases. So this is the phase diagram um, from Aidan et al. Uh, back in 1990. These are uh, phase boundaries showing uh, three three uh, superconducting phases. Uh, in a magnetic field, H versus T. And um, at zero temperature, there are two Meissner states. There are two superconducting phases uh, with a second superconducting transition occurring about uh, 50, 60 millikelvin below the onset of the first transition. Uh, these phase boundaries were obtained by measuring um, anomalies in the uh, in ultrasound velocity measurements, both sweeping temperature and sweeping field. So you'll see uh, also uh, the A phase is a very anisotropic phase. Uh, and the B phase is a phase which theoretically is predicted to break time reversal symmetry. So uh, what I want to show you is the first, uh, it's, it's a very, <clears throat> very uh, beautiful experiments that were done uh, on the B phase, on the A and B phase using polar Kerr effect. So this was a collaboration between uh, uh, Bill's lab and Aaron Kapitulnik's lab at Stanford, um, where they have a, a Senyak interferometer. And, uh, and, and uh, Bill provided uh, 
Bill's group provided uh, high quality single crystals appropriately cut to look at uh, reflected uh, light off of the C-axis uh, C-axis cut of the crystal. Now, the observation of the polar Kerr effect is an observation of, of uh, the anomalous Hall conductivity at optical frequencies. And uh, so there's uh, early, early work by a number of authors, including myself and Sunket, yep, um, back in 92, connecting broken P and T symmetry to circular birefringence and dichroism, and uh, correspondingly, the polar Kerr effect. So I want to show you the results of uh, uh, the work, which was Elizabeth Shim's thesis here. And it's, it's quite striking because uh, on the left-hand panel, you see, uh, you see the diamagnetic signal, which shows the onset of superconductivity at about uh, 550 millikelvin. Uh, and <clears throat> the onset of polar Kerr rotation occurring at a lower temperature of about 450 millikelvin. Uh, indicating that uh, broken time reversals and mirror symmetry onset in the B phase at the second transition. So um, this was a, a very um, uh, nice work. And uh, the, the point, one, one point that I want to add is that uh, one always sees basically max signal, single domain, single chiral domain in uranium platinum three. We, we don't really understand why but uh, we don't see multi-domains. Uh, uh, you can train uh, the domain with a, a tiny uh, um, field uh, to uh, pick the direction of the rotation angle or pick the chiral axis. So this, is a, uh, this provides some um, confirmation or, uh, of theoretical models which predict that in fact the A phase should be time reversal symmetric and the B phase uh, would be the onset of broken time reversal symmetry with a, a chiral order parameter. And uh, the one that I have investigated the most is one which has uh, a churn number of two. Now, <clears throat> okay, let me, let me preface uh, where we're going next uh, with the following comment. And I should ask Pinching, how am I doing on time? Yeah, they're doing fine. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Um, so the, uh, the, uh, the reflectivity studies here, of course, are measuring uh, the properties of uranium platinum three at, at the vacuum C axis boundary over a length scale of, of, the, of the penetration depth in the C axis direction. So, um, uh, one ideally would like to have confirmation uh, of these kind of results from a full bulk sig uh, signal. So that's kind of that's part of the motivation. So anomalous thermal hall effects uh, they go back to the discussion of of, of um, uh, quantum hall systems and. Um, and uh, also uh, chiral P wave states by Reed and Green, uh, which were discussing the, the contribution of a, uh, an anomalous Hall effect that would be, would be coming from the bulk topology uh, as it's expressed in terms of chiral edge states. And they in fact predicted a, a quantized value for the, uh, 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 the anomalous Hall effect or quantized in uh, or KXY over KBT that was quantized in proportional to the churn number as shown here. So what I want to point out is that there's also a bulk Hall effect coming from, uh, in, <clears throat> that's induced by impurity scattering. And uh, as I'll show you, it typically dominates the edge effect by, by several orders of magnitude. And so this is the work by Wave and, and myself uh, more recently. The motivation came from helium three and uh, and the uh, in the physics that's underlying the uh, anomalous Hall effect of an electron bubble moving through a gas of, of chiral quasi particles. And <clears throat> the thing I want to emphasize here is both require broken time reversal and mirror symmetry and non-trivial topology. 
So what happens um, when we, when a quasi-particle wind blows past fixed impurities? Okay, so if we, if we set up a, a thermal bias here and we, we, we drive a flux of hot quasi-particles through our, our superconductor, which have some impurities embedded in it, then um, of course, we're going to get a heat current uh, the quasi-particles are going to uh, scatter off the random field, uh, leading to heat diffusion. Um, <clears throat> and if we have a chiral superconductor, uh, the broken time reversal and mirror symmetry uh, and branch conversion scattering that occurs, uh, the chiral edge state formation and skew scattering that's in work at work uh, under these conditions will generate an anomalous thermal Hall effect. It's basically reversing the, the setup we had of the electron bubble moving through a gas of, of quasi-particles. We're gonna move the gas of quasi-particles past fixed impurities. So as a result, we'll get an anomalous thermal Hall effect and we'll have a corresponding Hall angle um, relating the heat current to the thermal bias. So these are calculations by wave. Um, uh, the upper panel shows the thermal conductivity, the longitudinal component. And uh, the thing I want to draw your attention to is uh, I've, I've scaled it to the thermal conductivity in the normal state at TC. So scale is one. And uh, the longitudinal conductivity is really insensitive to the impurity size. I've got uh, several different impurity size, ionic radii in units of the Fermi wavelength. And it's also insensitive to the, to the churn number, or the winding number nu. So uh, you can see that in the case of P wave versus D wave. And for all of the different uh, uh, impurity sizes here. So this is the two dimensional case or that of a cylindrical Fermi surface, fully gapped chiral 2D. Um, <clears throat> by contrast, the, the thermal Hall conductivity is is sensitive to both the ionic uh, radius and the, um, and the churn number. So in particular, I call your attention to the fact that, that um, uh, for chiral D wave, uh, point impurities uh, would not give rise to, a, to a, um, a hall conductivity, a thermal hall conductivity, uh, only for chiral P wave. So finite size impurities are, are which are of course, uh, which I think are the, uh, the, <clears throat> the typical situation, will activate uh, the Hall effect in, in, in chiral condensates with larger churn numbers. So this, is a <clears throat> this slide here shows the same results uh, shown earlier on the previous slide. Ah, let me say one more thing. Um, notice that the, the, I've, I've also normalized the Hall conductance to the normal state thermal conductivity. So uh, the scale for the Hall effect here, uh, of course it depends upon the density of impurities, but you can't put too many impurities without destroying uh, the, the condensate. So, so the typical values I've shown here for the Hall um, conductivity are about you know, 3% of the longitudinal conductivity if we're looking at higher temperatures and say point above 0.5. Now let's uh, look at the uh, thermal Hall conductance. Uh, again, now uh, uh, compared to the units of, of the quantized edge current Hall conductivity. So, so this is uh, uh, shown here for a particular um, uh, coherence length of about 50 Fermi wavelengths. And uh, you can see that the uh, the impurity conductivity is typically dominates by, by um, a couple of orders of magnitude over the edge, edge current. And the only way you can uh, get around this is, having a, is, is going to ultra low temperatures uh, under conditions in which you, the impurity concentration doesn't develop a finite density of states at the Fermi level then you can suppress the bulk contribution sufficiently to get down to the um, signal range of the edge conductivity. But that's still going to be a challenge. So um, with that, 
uh, I should say also, these are calculations uh, for 3D um, uh, Fermi surfaces, uh, and uh, in particular, those that are relevant for trying to identify signatures in uh, uranium platinum three. Uh, these are the four two dimensional representations, and you'll see they have substantial structure in, uh, in the anomalous thermal Hall effect, particularly differentiating uh, between nu equal one and nu equal two. So E1U and e, E1G are both nu equal one and uh, E2U and E2G are nu equal to two. So the nu equal one case can have um, a reverse sign on the, uh, on the, uh, on the bulk uh, thermal Hall effect compared with nu equal two. Well, those are probably a little bit <clears throat> too much detail, but, uh, but I just wanted to show you that we have we have diagnostics, which are bulk signatures uh, of, of chirality uh, coming from anomalous Hall transport. So let me finish with this last slide here. Where might we look for impurity-induced anomalous thermal Hall effect? Well, I just described one possibility being uranium platinum-3. Uh, there are a number of candidates involving helium-3 infused into anisotropic aerogels where theory predicts two distinct chiral phases. Um, helium-3 confined in uh, 100 nanometer cavities, uh, they should also exhibit an anomalous thermal Hall effect where the surface scattering uh, plays the role of impurity scattering. And of course, strontium ruthenate, I think would be an ideal candidate if, uh, uh, to, to look for anomalous thermal Hall effect as a bulk probe of the chirality. So, so with that, uh, I'll stop and uh, um, try and answer questions if people have questions. Uh, Jim, do, do you have recent uh, proposals for the uh, for the other compound? I mean, test the you know, time reversal symmetry breaking for the uh, uh, strontium platinum. And then no, I don't have a, a specific uh, material-based calculations for them, um, but. Uh, I, I could do if there was if there was interested, particularly uranium ditelluride, we've been just been right, talking right, about right. in my own group, but uh, but we don't have anything to report at this time. Okay, okay. Okay. So so recently the strontium rusnit O4 has been suggested instead of being the spin triplet, it's actually a spin singlet superconductor. So how yes. does that how, how does that change uh, your uh, you know uh, from uh, from a thermal conductivity point of view, how, how does that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, there's a there's a couple of ways in which you can have chiral V wave. Uh, so uh, one proposal, I think it's uh, Daniel Achterberg and his group have proposed that uh, that strontium ruthenate is a spin singlet chiral V wave mm -hmm. state uh, with nu equal one. Uh, there's a more complicated proposal that involves uh, two different irreducible representations. Uh, this, this came from Steve Kibbleson and, uh, and co-workers and collaborators that, uh, that strontium ruthenate uh, might be a, a system with uh, two representations that are nearly degenerate that form a broken time reversal phase. Uh, that's a combination of D and G wave pairing. So D plus IG. I think this would be a really ideal to look for that. And we would, we would certainly do detailed calculations uh, to test for that model and try and compare with, with the other candidates that have been put forward. For example, the new equal one chiral D wave state. I see. So, so do, you, do you have any suggestions in terms of both UPT3 and strontium ruthenate? Uh, what, what's the pairing mechanism? Oh, what, pairing mechanism. All right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a uh, that's a that's a talk in itself. Um, there's uh, of course evidence for both um, uh, I, I, I'm a little bit reluctant to get into uh, too much detail here because I'm not an expert on the um, on all of the calculations that have done of mechanisms for uranium platinum three, uh, but but if it's a spin fluctuator, which it was originally proposed uh, and, and shown evidence for in terms of its, its thermal properties um, back in the very beginning, early days from the Los Alamos group, uh, 
the exchange of spin fluctuations can produce both uh, ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic uh, spin fluctuations can produce uh, both spin singlet or spin triplet. So uh, uh, my uh, feeling about uranium platinum three is that it probably is uh, spin triplet. Uh, at least there's direct evidence for it being spin triplet. Uh, but it probably has also antiferromagnetic spin fluctuations that are that are affecting its properties as well. So uh, I know this uh, I know this in detail in the context of helium three. And helium three has long been thought to be uh, driven by um, the exchange of ferromagnetic spin fluctuations, uh, paramagnons. Uh, but it also uh, recently um, my with my former student, Josh Wyman, we've shown that there's a substantial antiferromagnetic spin fluctuations in helium-3 as well, and they're competing with each other. Uh, so that's another story. I, uh, that's, that's a one hour talk, uh, which I would be delighted to uh, talk about, but uh, uh, the best I can say is that these systems that, have, that, that are involving spin fluctuations they tend to have both types of fluctuations present, and it sometimes is a battle to see who wins. I see. So, so, so there's no, you know, a priori as far as you're concerned, that the spin triplet has to be driven by forum and the spin fluctuations. Well, uh, there's a preference for them. I'm not. I'm just saying that there there could be antiferromagnetic fluctuations present also. Okay. Sorry, and you I, see I them in a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah. So please, please ask, uh, please raise your hand or, or just, uh, you know, open your mic and ask, ask him. Yeah, hi, Yang. Yeah, so thanks for a great talk. Uh, I have a question about the spin of coupling because in this compound, it's heavy. Um, you have a strong spin of coupling, which is uh, for the ruthenium, maybe about 100 MeV or something. So spin triplet and singlets are now well separated. Yes, mixtures. So that's right. So uh, in that situations, how your theories of, um, um, let's say, anomalous thermal hall can modify it? Yeah. So I haven't treated the. Uh, uh, okay. So so you're right. Uh, you're exactly right. If we if we look at these compounds with strong spin orbit coupling, um, in the band structure, then. Um, then the classification of singlet and triplet is in terms of what, what Phil Anderson called pseudospin uh, triplet and pseudospin singlet. So that was, that was actually the language. I, I just dropped a pseudo. Um, uh, so in, in my own work on uranium platinum three, I, uh, I encoded that into you know, effective uh, magnetic moment couplings for the Zeeman effect, which of course, depend upon uh, the point, uh, the K point in momentum space, and they're generally a tensor structure as well. Uh, so I haven't discussed any uh, of that, but it's uh, but the analysis that I've done on uh, evidence for spin triplet pairing in uranium platinum three includes this distinction between pure spin singlet and triplet versus pseudo spin singlet and triplet. So, right. but I think I mean, you were referring to Schrunch and Ruthenate, right? Right. Um, so, well, any multi orbitals, uh, if you have like a, more than two Fermi surface, you come with the two orbitals with a two band. And you can think about having some spin orbit coupling between them. Uh, then, of course, one described in terms of pseudo spin singular, pseudo spin triplet, but uh, one has to go beyond that because uh, uh, you actually have both of them. Yeah. You're, you're really you have both time. coexisting uh, singlet and triplets. Pseudospin singlet, pseudospin triplet can live in the band. For example, you have intraband pseudospin singlet, interband pseudospin triplets, and um, and they all comes with even parity, odd parity. All depends if you don't break inversion symmetry, for example. So um, I, I just wonder if uh, anyone has gone into taking, for example, instead of single band, take a two band. Uh, and take your calculation, um, which will be more complex, but I think it's gonna be pretty useful for most of the multi-band 
Well, yes, I, I think I think it would be great if uh, if you wanted to do that. <laughs> I would be happy to. Uh, okay. I would be happy to. What do I ask questions? What I know about it. Telling me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. a great idea. I uh, I would uh, I would very much encourage it. So okay. I'd, uh, I'd be interested <laughs> I'll, in uh, following it. along. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question for Jim? I have a question, Jim. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I didn't see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No Go way. Ahead. Yeah. So, Jim, uh, the calculation that you did in helium three had impurities which were isotropic. They were isotropic impurities, little round balls. In uranium platinum three, as you mentioned, there are stacking faults, and they are prism plane stacking faults. And I'm wondering <clears throat> uh, what you would imagine the modification to the anomalous thermal Hall effect would be if you had what are well-defined prism plane stacking faults in the, in the thermal path. Oh boy, yeah. Uh, you would get, well, if they, were, if they were globally ordered on average, then uh, you would introduce an additional anisotropy coming from the anisotropic scattering off of the, off of the average and isotropy field, but um, if they're um, if they're not ordered, uh, then uh, then I'm not sure that you would be able to detect anything fundamentally different. It's just uh, being able to parameterize what the effective uh, ionic radius would be for these anisotropic scatterers is uh, is something that um, you know I haven't I haven't really thought how to do that. Now, I have done it in the context of aerogels where uh, I've modeled the impurities as line, line impurities or uh, small um, ellipsoidal impurities. Uh, and there, uh, there you get interesting uh, effects. You, you, as I said, if you, if you globally order them, then you get uh, additional anisotropy that's in, in addition to the anisotropy of the broken symmetry phase. So why don't you start start with a global uh, a, a global distribution, which are all uh, aligned? They're all ordered. A single plane, which is presented uh, to the in the thermal path, and then worry about averaging over all three domains. Yeah, I can do that. I haven't done it uh, so far. I've just I've just considered. Um, uh, finite size uh, isotropic impurities in uh, for the thermal Hall effect, but good good point. I think it's also relevant for the anisotropic aerogels too because those impurities are tend to be very anisotropic. Okay. Yeah, any, any Ask me questions? some more hard questions I can't answer. <laughs> Yoshi, Yoshi. Yeah, sorry you had you had to stay so late and so early in the morning in Japan. <laughs> Hi. Uh, hey, okay, okay, so I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, yeah, please. Yes. Okay. So uh, first, the pedagogical uh, question on terminology. So the uh, for uh, ferromagnetic superconductors, we normally use the word non-unitary. And yeah. uh, this, uh, so in your definition, uh, can we say that uh, non-unitary state is a part of the chiral superconducting state? Um, I thought chiral was used for orbital sector and non-unitary was used for time reversal symmetry breaking for the spin sector. Yeah, that's the way I've been using it, Yoshi. Uh, you're right. If I look at the A1 phase of helium-3 or I look at the ferromagnetic, you know, uranium, cobalt, germanium-5 type class, then uh, yes, those are non-unitary. Uh, they break time reversal symmetry uh, in the spin sector. And, so, and they're one-dimensional so, orbital representations, typically in the, in the orbital sector. Right, so, but they are both uh, chiral superfluids. Um, yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. You would uh, if you if you include now uh, um, uh, the mirror reflections of the uh, in the spin right. sector as well. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I have a comment. Uh, for the thermal uh, uh, hole effect uh, for strontium ruthenate, uh, 
our group and in collaboration, other groups uh, try, have been trying to observe it, but the thermal conductivity, in-plane thermal conductivity of strontium ruthenate is just too high to, to develop any uh, transverse uh, uh, temperature gradient. So it's very difficult, challenging to observe this. Yeah. Uh, but we have been trying, yeah. Okay, okay. Can, very interesting. Can you purposely then, put some impurity? Can you purposely dope some impurity and try it? Uh, impurity, yeah. Yeah, you, you uh, can purposely put some impurity in strong symbolism. Right, right. Yeah, but TC goes on. I, I think we have a re reasonable try uh, in terms of uh, t different TCs. I see. Uh, and then uh, it's, it's, a, a it's, a, it's a battle between not suppressing TC and uh, getting enough impurity right. density to, to uh, get a large enough effect in the transverse direction, yeah. So Yoshi, Yoshi, uh, Jim's uh, theory has that in the presence of impurities, that the thermal gradient, uh, <coughs> or rather the, the temperature, transverse temperature difference will integrate and scale with the width of your sample. Uh, that's not true, obviously, for the edge currents alone. So right. in fact, if you put impurities, this was just discussed a few seconds ago, if you put in impurities into your sample, you'll decrease the normal state thermal conductivity. And you will also get uh, an effect which scales with the width. Right. So the aspect ratio of the uh, sample geometry may also be important in doing the actual experiment. Mm -hmm. OK. OK, so uh, uh, may I ask another question about the edge yeah, current? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. So uh, the. So people, uh, experimenters, are trying to observe uh, uh, edge current of the chiral superconductors. And uh, for uh, uranium uh, ruthenium to silicon too, I saw a recent uh, uh, paper and archive uh, from uh, uh, Moller's group, Cam Moller's group. Yeah, they tried to observe uh, using a scanning squid, the evidence for a uh, magnetic field associated with chiral edge current but they have negative effect uh, uh, results. Uh, they did not observe any evidence for it. Right. Uh, it's a uh, chiral D-wave uh, uranium between to silicon two. And my question was uh, about the uh, uranium PT3. Uh, have there been any effort to observe uh -huh. uh, magnetic field associated with chiral edge current? That's a, that's a great question. I, I've been uh, talking with, uh, with Bill about that. Um, uh, so perhaps Bill would prefer to talk about it. There's a suggestion of making, um, uh, of patterning small structures using FIB on uranium platinum three and um, uh, in order to do exactly this, to, to, to search for the, um, uh, the magnetic signature of the chiral edge states. So I, I did have a slide here, but I don't think it's been published. So I took it out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. A any other questions for, for Jim? Okay. I if not, yeah, we, we appreciate this very much. And, well, and I, I want to nice thank work. you. Uh, and yeah. I, uh, I feel honored to be able to talk to such a distinguished group of people here. I mean, <laughs> I, I, it, you have a you have a big audience, and so <laughs> well, I, I hope much. I did justice to the field. Yeah, so, so, so next week uh, we'll, we'll be welcoming uh, Bill Harpern. So, so he's going to give us an experimental aspect of, of the same problem. Hopefully with these two talks, you know, the student will be able to understand what is going on with spin triplet superconductivity. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Pension. Yeah, thank you.